Well, welcome to the second Saturday here at the Bay Veterans Foundation uh, in, in Bay City, uh, sponsored by the Bay County Historical Museum. I'm going to just introduce a guy who needs no introduction because <laughs> everybody knows Keith Markstrom. And, and, but then he can talk about himself a little bit better than I can. So, and then he's going to introduce Nancy, who's going to talk about the history of the building. So, Keith Markstrom. Thanks, Mike. We appreciate uh, uh, you choosing us to have the second Saturday program. Um, I'm Keith Markstrom, President of Bay Veterans Foundation. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of our organization and then turn it over to Nancy Manning, who has researched the history on this site and, and the buildings. And, uh, uh, and then we will break up for those who have time or interest in taking a tour of the building. So we started, we officially became a not-for-profit organization in 2015. Um, after I retired from the hospital, as, and so did Mike Jamrog, we ran a couple of golf outings uh, through the checkbook of the military order Purple Heart. And we were making so much money on it that John DeWise, who was in charge, said we, we couldn't do it anymore. So, we thought we were pretty successful and it uh, necessitated us to become a not-for-profit organization. So in, uh, our, our intention was to create a workshop for veterans. We had no concept other than a few people, a few guys actually, would be gathering to work on some small wood working projects and uh, instill some of the camaraderie that we all knew when we were in the service, regardless of what branch it was. Well. In 20, late 2015, we were approached by city government and county government, uh, thanks to the efforts of Don Carlion, former president of Delta College. Don was, on, was the chair of the library board at that time, and he felt kind of bad that when the Wirt Library was constructed, it took a bit of what was known as Battery Park. Uh, Battery Park, uh, the, the origin of it goes back to the Civil War. It was at one time a parade mustering recruitment grounds for soldiers from the Civil War through World War I. And it was split by Center Avenue. So we, we were asked by the city and county to raise funds to renovate Battery Park. It had fallen into quite a disrepair. There were a lot of gnarly trees, wires from previous projects, uh, sidewalks on the, in front of the library had been newly laid, but not in accordance with the angle that the former ones were, uh, which was in the, when, when you, if you look from aerial view down the, on the north side, which is this side of the park, didn't match up with the south side because they were new. And Don was a little bit upset because they, they took away that original diamond shape that was built by both sides of the, of the road. Anyway, we raised about $190,000 and we put some benches in, put a little park circle, um, new sidewalks, landscaping, and so on and so forth. And that park then was rededicated in June of 2016 by Roger Donlan. Uh, Colonel Donlan was the first Medal of Honor recipient from, the, uh, from Vietnam, 1964. He's our honorary chair. He lives in Kansas City. He must be 95, 97 years old now. Anyway, he came and rededicated. Then in 2017, we raised money at the invitation of the uh, Herschel Woody Williams Foundation, Hers Herschel Williams was a flamethrower in the Battle of Iwo Jima, World War II. And he, when he came to dedicate the Gold Star Monument, um, he was the sole surviving Medal of Honor from that battle. Uh, he dedicated it on, on September 30th, which was Gold Star Mother's Day, now known as Gold Star Mothers and Family Day. His idea was after he survived World War II and then he worked for the VA for a number of years, he started a foundation <clears throat> to commemorate and honor the families 
of those that lost a loved one in service to our country. He recalled when <clears throat> he worked as a telegram delivery boy with Western Union in West Virginia, when he would bicycle up to a house and deliver a telegram that informed the parents that their son had been killed. He said he never forgot the anguish and the collapsing and the, the pain. And that drove him to then have a mission of putting a monument in every one of the 50 states. Well, we did the first one in Michigan. There's one now in Monroe. Um, all 50 states, all 50 states have them. And some states have three or four. So again, that's to honor the families, not the soldier or the sailor. So when we achieved that, uh, we raised 140000 to to put that monument in, which is the northwest quadrant right by City Market. Uh, the cannons that are in the, in the park, there's a uh, what's called a uh, mortar cannon in front of the library. That's the real big one, if you have noticed. That weighs about 19,000 pounds. Uh, it would throw a cannonball, a 13-inch ball, that weighed 200 pounds. If you used a 20-pound charge at a 45-degree angle, it would throw that ball 4,400 yards. And oftentimes, there was a timed fuse. The ball was filled with shrapnel. And it was timed so that as it got over the battlefield, it would blow up and create more devastating uh, shrapnel. So when we were getting ready or starting to raise the money for that park, we saw some postcards that had the can in. I thought, man, that would really be something if we could get something like that. Well, the short story is one of our Civil War Roundtable members said that those, uh, the plans for those uh, foundries for those cannon were available through the Library of Congress. So for 40 bucks, we sent and got the plans for the two cannon and took them to Baycast and the Holman family cast those for us. So the exterior is to the specifications of the originals. Obviously they're not working cannon, but they're still pretty heavy. Uh, so then we'll, we'll jump to this project. In 2018, we raised 140000 to buy this building and the one adjacent to it. It looks like this is all one building, but Nancy will talk about the separation of the two buildings. Um, and we started our campaign to raise money to create a workshop, a wood shop. Well, when we had an environmental study, it showed that this was a gas station and there was contaminated soil. And as they did a phase two, taking core samplings out of the parking lot area, discovered contaminated soil down 25 feet. And then they found a tank of oil that had PCBs in it. And then the DEQ said, you know, you probably should check this building for asbestos, of which it was both on the interior and the exterior. So our, our budget from, for about 450000 bloomed to $1.2 million. Because after the asbestos was removed, that exposed all the uh, structural deficiencies, electric, plumbing, HVAC of which when we had a billing inspection, it all worked. So uh, that threw us in kind of a uh, tailspin to some degree, but we've been able to raise a little over a million. We still have about 140,000 to raise to complete the metal shop, of which you can see. And uh, it gets us to today where we have a functioning wood shop. We have, uh, we've just started programming. We've had a, a sewing class one of our Air Force veterans, um, she's taught, she's teaching how to make aprons out of denim for either shop aprons or grilling aprons or something like that. Uh, we've had two suicide awareness prevention trainings in this room. Our first one, we had 22 people, 19 were veterans. Uh, mental health is a huge issue for us here, and that's the whole reason is, you know, everybody thinks it's a workshop. Well, it's an engagement center. It's about getting people together because a lot of veterans isolate themselves. They don't know where to turn. When you get out of the service, it's quite a shock to go from structure, discipline, everything's planned for you, to all of a sudden you're making your own decisions and it's pretty chaotic. So 
what we, we recognize that uh, these Afghan and Iraq veterans who are returning were receiving a much, much better reception, but they still suffered the same uh, issues, depression, PTSD, substance abuse, etc. So that was really the main impetus of why we wanted to start this, to get veterans together. And it's been a slow, well, we only got our occupancy permit in January of earlier this year. So in that time, uh, we've had, we have our second class from Eastern High School. Eastern High School is the alternative high school. Uh, kids there, there's about 130 kids in that school. They don't have the family life that most of us had. And they don't have the resources at that school like some of the other schools. So we were asked if we would serve as mentors to help with career exploration and um, hands-on woodworking acti activities. So last spring, we had our first class. We had 12 kids in it that dropped down to 10. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we started our this year's class. We have 12, and, uh, and these kids are really a joy. They're, they're, they're really good people, and they've got great talent. So they just don't have the, the support and the encouragement. So that's what we're trying to do. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Nancy because she's got a much more interesting presentation about the history of this area. And uh, then after she's concluded, again, if you're interested in a tour, we'd be glad to. We, we've got a number of tour guides here. We'll split you up. And so thank you for attending today. Well, thanks, Keith. And hi, everybody. <laughs> We're doing this kind of a, a little bit old fashioned. We're not doing a PowerPoint here or anything today, but uh, I'm gonna pass these around. These are uh, pictures of the way the buildings looked when uh, the foundation purchased it. Uh, I know Keith from working at the hospital. We worked at different ends of the same building on Lincoln Center. Um, when he, um, I wanted to help out in some way when he started uh, this project, and I thought it would, my husband Jerry would really enjoy it, and so I talked to Keith about it, and Jerry got involved, and then I wanted to help out some way, and so he said I could research this if I would like to. Um, I write history, I'm a copy editor, and I've been doing it for 20 years now, and I do Michigan history. So I started researching by coming over here with Jerry, and he took photos of the buildings. And we found out there were three buildings th with three different addresses. And I thought, well, this is going to be fun. And uh, Keith, I believe, uh, helped me with some title um, search that you had acquired. But I used censuses, city directories, ancestry, archive newspapers, fire insurance maps, postcards, photos, just all kinds of things. And I compiled a notebook for the foundation. It took me six months to gather everything up and do this. Um, so today we're in one of two joined buildings that shaped the workshop and learning center. On the other side of the hallway is the other building and that building um, is a 1908 building, I believe. Um, that's a two-story building, and uh, it was uh, originally used as uh, the people who purchased the property used it as a grocery store and apartment. But anyhow, we are in these two buildings that are situated on lots six, five, and part of four of block 36 in Bay City. And outside the window here, you'll see Bautel Place. Bautel Place used to be an alley in the neighborhood. And the other six lots to block 36 are on the other side of Bautel, and that's where the Pierre Marquette Depot was built. So there were vacated buildings that happened. The neighborhood was disturbed to do this. Um, th those uh, photos that I passed around, I can show you here. This is, um, I've got a couple 
pictures here. This is a rash or fire insurance map. And this shows where 30, block 36 is. And you'll see that we take up two, two lots and a little bit more there. This is where Bowtell Place was put in around after, well, it was put in when the uh, Pier Marquette went in, I think 1904, when the building was completed. And this down here is where Ben Bowtell's property was. And he kind of plays into this too. He was a big promoter for um, the Pier Marquette. And uh, so anyhow, the other side is the layout. It's a GIS map that shows this is the slab building that we're, we're sitting in, part of the concrete building, the original one that uh, was built by KR Metal. And then this is the other building on the other side of the hallway. And then there's a garage so um, and the parking lot. So there's the three buildings <clears throat> that, are, that comprise it. This one <clears throat> was um, originally 1009. North Madison, just like it's identified now. But the other building um, on the other side was first identified as 220 Bowtell, and then it became, I, I don't know, it, it, right now it's 1006 uh, is the way it's identified. The uh, garage is identified as 400 or 500 fourth. 501 4th Street, so they were all different addresses. And there were people who lived in in those places. Um, the Tinlands are the people who constructed the building who's next door. Uh, they originally moved from, the part that was originally 1009 was a story and a half uh, boarding house. And Philip and Sarah Tinlin moved in there from um, 1901. And they, uh, it showed, it says research back to 1884 shows that a story and a half boarding house existed at 1009 from 1884 to 1940. And back then we had a farmer, a steward, peddler, sailor, lumber inspector, artist, traveling salesman, common laborer. Those are the types of people who were living there. And the Philip Tinlin family, they, um, they moved from, uh, they first lived at uh, Van Buren Street, and then they moved here to North Madison in about 1901, and they moved into the 1009 building. And they lived there for a little while, and they uh, decided to build this uh, grocery store and apartment house that faced Bowtell. And uh, it didn't work out so well for them. They, they, bought, they bought it, apparently thinking the Pure Marquette's going to be here, and you know we're going to get a lot of traffic. And that didn't work so well, and they ended up uh, I don't know, I think they must have leased it or something of that nature to other people to operate. They ended up moving then to 1011 Madison, which doesn't really exist anymore as a, a, you know, a housing place. Um, and then in 1921, they moved across the street to 1006 North Madison, which was an apartment building that their daughter and son-in-law eventually purchased. So they kind of moved around. But the Tinlins, um, their son, they had two children. They had James and Aileen. And James served in the world, in uh, World War I in the Army. And he was uh, in the medical department ambulance company. And he was classified as a wagoner. And I had to look that up. But a wagoneer back then, actually, he had a, you know horses and a wagon. And so he also played in uh, local baseball at, I think it was the Clarkston Park. Is, and then um, he was in minor league baseball, too, for a while. 
And sadly, Philip Tinlin was 66 years old, and he's riding his bicycle to work on a construction job on the Tuscola State Highway. And so he set out from here to go five miles, and he died from a sudden stroke. This was in June of 1921. And they were then living at the apartments across the street. So um, Aileen, their one daughter, she was uh, 11 years younger than James, and um, she was only about three years old when they moved here. And she was married at 19 and divorced about five years later. She came back home to live with her folks, and she worked as a dressmaker. And then she married a fireman, and they had the apartment house across the street. So that's a little bit about the Tinlands. This, um, these incidentally are the pictures. There's the um, depot. We, this was a postcard we found, and it shows, you have a better picture of this, I think, Keith, in the other room, a bigger one, but um, it shows the uh, grocery store at that point. You know, it looks like it was nice red brick or something, and Keith can tell you more about the construction of that, but it, um, this, uh, let me see here. Oh, I think you have a picture of uh, wings and things that's floating around. Mm -hmm. That was it. And um, this is another picture that um, a gentleman found later on, and it's really a great picture. Uh, it's from about 1908, as close as I could find, because the ad on the side is, uh, it shows the location of 3rd and Johnson, and uh, these people actually were on uh, 914 North Johnson, which is, I think, around 5th by 1909. So this is probably, you know, an earlier picture, 1908, of, of kind of what the building looked like. And I have some pictures on the back, the best I could find. Um, this was Sarah. I couldn't find one of Philip. This was Aileen. And this is um, the tin ceiling, which Keith and Jerry uh, guys are familiar with. This is a picture of Ben Bautel and, and of his house. And uh, he was located, it was located um, at nine, 901 North Madison. And I recall reading that when they added the black topping, he wanted to see it stretched down to his house too. And it, he had this really huge, the huge property there. But this was his house that was built uh, in 1892, but it was raised in 1954. It was used as a um, juvenile detention year, the last uh, juvenile detention home, the last 18 years. Um, Tim Bautel is very involved. He's helped help them. Big donor. A big, great donor here. Here, this is. Uh, they had in the two-story grocery store an upstairs apartment. Well, when it, things didn't work out so well, um, grocery stores and restaurants were operated by different people from 1906 to 1930. Sarah Tinlin had it about 1906 to nine as a grocery, then Mary Drake in 1909. And um, these, are, these are some clippings that, um, uh, Mary was selling off household goods and stock of a small grocery store when she took it over, and later she was really advertising hard for uh, the restaurant. And she had she had some great deals there. I think was it two fifty for uh, twenty one meals. Twenty one meals for two fifty. I mean, it, it, it's uh, um, Maud Ayers. She was here in nineteen eleven. And she was a grocer living upstairs or living at 220. Um, possibly she opened the store after Mary. Mina Lamont was 1919. They had Lamont's Cash and Carry Grocery. And um, then there was a Mrs. Schneider, 1921 to 24. She, there was a piece in the paper. She was requesting permission for a sign in front of the restaurant. And then Arthur Lefevre, who came 
after her from 24 to 29, he was requesting permission for an electric sign in front of the restaurant. It's kind of puzzling because we haven't come across, well, in that one picture, there's no awning on the building. And I, I don't know if anybody ever got a sign. But um, then the other building we have is 501 4th Street. That's the garage. Um, there was a prior dwelling there and um, some past occupants. Occupants from 1884 through 33 included a contractor, bagging master, engineer, a railroad flagman, and a housekeeper. Uh, in in um, KR, let me see here, KR Metals bought this in about 1940. I think I, okay, we've got all the. Okay, about 1940, and um, they transferred all of Lot 6 to Daniel Haley and Shamrock Oil and Refining, which would account for some of what Keith had to deal with, um, who in turn transferred the property to Monarch Service Stations. And then there were some other transfers, but um, those businesses included Monarch, uh, Paul's Midtown Bay Service Station, Don's Auto Glass, Bay City Towing. And then um, from 1983 to 2018, there was nothing, nothing um, listed. Uh, KR Metal Engineer, they sold the building to Leo and 220 or 1006 to Leo and Bernice Pachowiak. Pardon me, he's Polish, but I can't, I can't do Polish well. And and Robert and Shirley Murray, who named the Bautel building the, the PM Arcade for I guess Pachowiak and Murphy. And they had a lot of businesses and organizations that operated there from 1958 to 2003 when uh, the Murray trans Trust transfers were completed to Almar Realty Corporation, then to Ann McDaniel, Mark Zimmer, and finally the Bay Veterans Foundation. Occupants of the buildings, and I think this is pretty interesting, were the Social Security offices. They were here from 1958 to 1987. Leo Pachowiak Bookkeeping Services, Robert F. Murray's, Murray's were our accountants for um, and Lapan Builders, Delta Advertising, Burkhardt's Moving Company, Marcan. Marcan in those pictures, their paintings on the side of the building. Elks Lodge was here. Wings and Things was um, the last really notable thing. That was from 2012 to 18, and then the foundation. So I think that, that kind of tells us most of the history that we have here. Um, I wanted to say that Ben Bautel, um, I, it was pretty neat when I found, um, this is this is the notebook I comprised there long ago, but um, Ben Bautel, in an article in the May 23rd, 1901, West Bay City Times Press, uh, it tells about the outcomes of a May 22nd businessman's meeting at the Fraser House. And the meeting was called by the mayor and E.M., I'm going to spell this, W-E-A-T-I-A-N, Weishan, a Pierre Marquette agent was present. And Captain Ben Bautel spoke first because he had to leave early. And what he said is, this time, the time, post-logging industry, has come when improvements of any kind should be made and inducements offered to bring in new industries to the city. I do not believe the Pier Marquette Company will ever build a depot unless some concessions are made. I will sign an agreement to close either 4th or 5th Avenues and give as much money as anyone in order to secure a respectable depot. Now we've talked about a depot for 20 years and are no nearer than ever. 
and shortly after that, um, things began to happen. So that's kind of neat. Very nice. Good. Thank you, Nancy. Yep. Any questions of Nancy regarding the <laughs> yeah. history of the buildings? Um, yeah. Oh, thank, thank you. <laughs> I uh, survived it. <laughs> she also has some handouts. I'm better at writing. <laughs> She has handouts that we'll put in the other room and as you go through the tour, then you can pick them up as well as <clears throat> this is an overview of the building and our programs that uh, we also put. We we'll just put those on the table in the next one. Thank you. So interesting history. Um, we're very happy that we were able to uh, purchase this because it's only a block and a half from Battery Park. And I, I've neglected to tell you what happened to those original cannon. There was a congressman by the name of Loud. His district encompasses this area all the way up to Alpena. He lived in Alpena. And when he was in Congress visiting a South Carolinian congressman in South Carolina, he noticed a lot of Civil War cannon just piled up. And he thought, well, if I could bring some of those back to my district, that would help me maybe get some votes because he didn't have a presence in this area. Well, I don't know how many he brought back or had shipped back, and, and all he had to do was pay what was called a drage fee. And that was for rail car or horse and wagon to get them here. Uh, there was one, there's one in Petoskey, one in Charlevoix. There were two at the Sage Library. There were two in front of City Hall, and there were four in Battery Park. And in 1940s, the early 1940s, as it looked, uh, closer and closer that we were going to enter into the war. The Grand Army of the Republic, which was a Civil War organization, uh, veterans organization, agreed to release those cannon to be used for the World War II war effort. So I thought many times, geez, if they would have just kept one. but so. so anyway, any questions about the building or the project at this point? then I think we will break up into groups and we'll give you a tour of the buildings. And so this two-story area was the original building built back in the late 1890s, early 1900s that served as a grocery store and then later or as a restaurant and then later as a grocery store. And the upper area was a boarding house. At one time there were four rooms up there. Later a bathroom was open so it reduced it to three and they're essentially bedrooms. Uh, in fact, some of the folks that worked in the restaurant lived upstairs there. So the brick on that upper level uh, are actually poured in slabs. They look like individual, but they're, they're slabs. And our architect, local architect, John Meyer, looked at that one time and he said that he's never seen that before in Bay City. Now, the lower level is brick that we found that kinds of matches that. And we still uh, need to paint the block building here in the brick, and then it'll blend better with our metal siding. We've tried to improve the neighborhood to complement the depot. So we re refer to this as the lounge. Uh, this coffee stuff and refrigerator that's in here is temporary until we finish the floor over in where there's a kitchenette. We'll go to that next. So the idea here was getting some recliner chairs and uh, TV and so on, but we all agreed that we don't want people to come in here and just flop, so we're not gonna have a TV. We wanna engage people. If they wanna sit in here and discuss or play cards or read a book, that would be fine, but it's, it, the idea is to keep people active in some of the other pro uh, projects. Uh, the, the chairs and table, except for the large one, were donated to us by Bay City Mall. We received a lot of, of uh, in-kind gifts from different businesses and, and uh, individuals. So this is the classroom. There's a larger picture of the postcard that we uh, sent around in the lecture. And this is our building looking from the Northwest. This was the original grocery store restaurant. That was the boarding house. This uh, side of the building looks like brick, but if you look closer, it's wavy. And then when it was uncovered, we uh, found it was tin, pressed to look like brick. These are some of the plaques that 
we're making on our CNC machine. Um, we're selling these for $100, and it's to honor a veteran in somebody's family. And then when we get a batch of these completed, we will mount them in the hallway uh, as kind of a permanent uh, recognition of veterans. So this classroom is where we hold the uh, morning session for the alternative high school, Eastern High School. Um, we were charged with, again, providing career uh, education or information and hands-on woodworking activity. So we have our 12 kids that show up in here. Uh, against that wall are some of the items that have been made in the shop or that we'll be making in the shop. Again, we need to sustain ourselves and we think that we can generate some decent income from that. On this wall is the uh, guitars. There's an organization called Guitars for Vets and it's a referral by the VA for those who are suffering some kind of a mental uh, depression, PTSD, etc. Uh, it's like a music therapy and it's one-on-one -on -one instruction and in 10 weeks if a person completes that then they will receive one of the guitars. So this is uh, what we're calling the metal shop. Uh, it lacks plumbing, lighting, electrical, uh, so we need to finish raising funds and once this is completed, the whole building, the whole project will have been completed here. So um, we will eventually have welding equipment in here, pipe threading, cutting machines. Uh, we have a compressor that was donated. We will be activating that here and then piping air up and over into the wood shop. This was one of the panels from the tin ceiling that was in the grocery store. And uh, we had these power, uh, we had them uh, sandblasted because it was uh, uh, lead paint on them and primed. And we're gonna color, paint these with some kind of a color. And they've been cut down so that we can mount them in the drop ceiling. So again, we can pick up some of this historic flavor uh, for the building. So this is the office reception area. Uh, we just completed the epoxy on this floor. It's like three levels of epoxy. These are end cuts from timbers that we sliced in our, on our bandsaw, glued down, and then covered with the epoxy from West Bend Systems, Goujon Brothers. So this was where the tin ceiling was. Uh, it was higher than this, of course. This was the old restaurant and then eventually grocery store. We temporarily moved our coffee uh, stuff over to the lounge because we've been working on the floor. Now we can bring that back in here and we've discussed having a soup group Thursday or some day of the week where uh, anybody in the building would like to come have soup and sandwich would be welcome. So again, um, we're, we're more of an engagement center than a workshop, although that's what we've referred to this as. It's about getting people to come in, engage with them, help them find whatever solutions they uh, need for their problems. And if they don't have any problems, that's fine. Uh, they can help be mentors to others. This is an electrical training wall that was created by um, Escon Electric and parts donated by Medler Electric. This is to train people on basic electricity. Uh, how to install a, a wall switch or a light or how to wire appropriately, put a circuit box in and so on. So this is uh, what we refer to as the wood shop or workshop. Uh, all these uh, work sites are mobile. We received the bases, the chrome bases, from uh, the old Yonker store when they were tearing that down. and. Uh, at each site, there's a specialty, like this is table saw area, skill, uh, jigsaw, sanding, planers, etc. We have pretty much all the woodworking equipment that somebody would need to, to really build something. Uh, we're just accumulating a lot more lumber. Uh, in fact, we've gotten so much uh, wood donated that we've got to find somebody that can help identify it. Um, and we'll be making charcuterie boards and chess boards and, you know, smaller projects that people can learn how to use the equipment. Uh, up here on this 
cabinet on the top are projects that one of our guys made. These are prototypes of items that will be made by the students in Eastern High School in this class. Last year we had them build dog houses and it was too aggressive of a project for them. But here they can learn how to use a hand saw, a coping saw, a drill, and uh, create something that they can take home real quick and say, oh my gosh, I, I, this, I did this. These are the work tops for the office area for computer stations. These were made from floor joists from that room. Uh, so th these will be over 100 years old as finished lumber, and they probably came from 100-year-old trees. But uh, one of our guys uh, used those floor joists, made these work site tops, and we're about ready to put the, uh, install them in the office uh, area. Here's our first aid station. We have a defibrillator. We've had training on this. Uh, in another couple weeks, we'll have a stop the bleed class, uh, Narcan administration, and just basic first aid. So this is what we refer to as the tool crib. A lot of these packaged tools here and then down and around are uh, drills, power nailers, uh, you name it, a lot of hand tools that were donated to us by Milwaukee Tool and Ace, uh, Woodside Ace Hardware. Uh, Milwaukee Tool went in and said that they would like to be the sole provider of tools and that they would buy the inventory, of which they did, and those two companies donated all these tools, which was about $20,000 worth. So this is our CNC machine, of which we're using to make things like this. This is a plaque that will be mounted on the electrical training wall, uh, recognizing ESCON and Meddler Electric. Uh, here are some of the plaques, again, that we're making for $100, for $100 to honor a veteran in somebody's family. We'll mount these on the walls in the hallway. Our newest machine is this laser engraver. We just got this hooked up. We'll probably be starting to use it this next week, and uh, we're very excited. This came from the funds from the uh, Dow LPGA Golf Tournament. We were one of the organizations selected, and we used that $4,500 uh, to purchase this. We also have a couple of 3D printers, and we also have a, a young Army veteran who's going to bring her uh, silk screening equipment in here so we can make like volunteer t-shirts and that for folks here in the building. This, uh, these little frames here are uh, guitar and ukulele molds. One of our guys will be teaching uh, how to build a ukulele and uh, we've got some very talented, very creative people who just amaze me every day on, uh, on what they come up with and how they resolve problems. We uh, just started a lathe turning class. We've got four guys involved and we've got five professional turners uh, that will be teaching basic turning, intermediate, and then advanced. Uh, this is one of the more advanced pieces that one of the turners made, just as an example. Um, they're starting out with simple blocks and they'll turn these into cups or small bowls, uh, really just to get the feel of the lathe and the knives and so on. We're real big on safety. Everybody that comes into this class has got to have special safety on the lathe, but anybody that's going to be in the workshop will have to go through our basic safety training class uh, before they come in here and operate equipment. We're, we're very grateful for the uh, in-kind support and the financial support that we've received. Um, this project started out at under half a million and went to 1.2 million. We've raised over a million dollars of it, but we still have programming, equipment, and uh, materials to purchase. If anybody's interested in donating, uh, you can send a check made out to Bay Veterans Foundation slash workshop and send it to Post Office Box 1513, 
Bay City 48706. We also have a Facebook page and our website is under reconstruction. So if anybody has uh, wood, uh, especially hardwood, but even pine, uh, we would gladly come pick it up and accept it. Um, we were, we're veterans directed and veteran focused, but we're not exclusively for veterans. As we talked about the kids from Eastern High School, if we have a lathe class here and there's four spots and three are taken by veterans, we will certainly open up to a civilian. We, we're part of the larger community, rely on the larger community, and we want to help bridge the gap between the veterans community and that larger community. So um, we're, we're always grateful for anything that somebody says, oh, would you, can I give you this? Even paint. So.